Hi, welcome to another session of Anatomy Doubt Clearing. Which vertebrae are the most movable segment in the vertebral column? The question is clear actually. The answer is cervical, but there was some confusion between cervical and lumbar. So the thing is the lumbar vertebrae are largest and carry most of the body weight. They allow more range of motion than the thoracic spine, but less than that of cervical. The atlas C1 and axis C2 make up most uh, make up the most mobile section of the entire spine. Now, which nerve is compressed by aneurysm of the posterior communicating artery in the circle of villus? So first we have to know what is aneurysm. Aneurysm is this ballooning and weakened area in an artery. Normally bigger arteries like iota brain have you know develop aneurysms and when they rupture they can cause internal bleeding or depending on which area it is they can cause stroke and the thing is that they often have no symptoms until they rupture so they can be quite dangerous right now the next thing is okay posterior communicating artery in the brain is somewhat prone to aneurysms okay so here is the uh, circle of villus and this is the posterior communicating artery now we have to see which uh, which of these gets affected by the aneurysm hypophysis cerebri is pituitary okay this stalk that you see is that of the anterior pituitary it is close to the posterior communicating artery right the trochlear nerve now this is the um, posterior uh, sorry the circle of villus and these are the nerves that are coming out of the different regions of the brain so we see that trochlear nerve is coming out from here so it's a little farther away from posterior communicating artery and we have the oculomotor nerve okay this over here is the oculomotor nerve and the optic nerve this entire thing is the optic chiasma and this is the optic nerve so we see that most of these structures are close to the posterior communicating artery okay now but the closest of all is actually the uh, oculomotor nerve it almost runs parallel to the posterior communicating artery so if there is a aneurysm like this in the posterior communicating artery it will press on to the third nerve okay or the oculomotor nerve see here you know the ballooning is pressing compressing the third nerve and that causes pupillary dilatation all right so the answer is third nerve now next question is sensory supply of the soft palate is from so the answer is glossopharyngeal nerve and the maxillary nerve now the student didn't have a problem in the uh, you know the option he had the op, uh, the uh, problem as to how are the middle and posterior lesser palatine nerves branches of the maxillary nerve so let's revise the branches of the maxillary nerve okay now this is uh, the maxillary nerve is a part of the trigeminal nerve the trigeminal nerve has ophthalmic maxillary and mandibular branches so the maxillary nerve itself is quite a long uh, nerve and it has uh, branches uh, in, the, in the cranium which is called the meningeal nerve and then the second part is uh, you know branches in the sphenopalatine fossa so here is the sphenopalatine fossa and here is the sphenopalatine ganglion so the maxillary let's see the you know this is expanded here maxillary nerve is topographically related to the sphenopalatine ganglion that means that it gives two sensory uh, branches to the uh, ganglion but these branches do not relay in the ganglion they just pass through the ganglion okay so these two branches then divide into several other branches the orbital branch the uh, um, the, uh, the nasal branch the posterior inferior nasal branch of the anterior palatine nerve the anterior or the greater palatine nerve then the lesser palatine which comprises of the middle and posterior palatine nerve the pharyngeal nerve okay so the student had the doubt as to how is the middle and posterior palatine branch a branch uh, of maxillary nerve so now we know because it goes through the uh, sphenopalatine ganglion it real it does not relay in the ganglion but it branches inside the ganglion 
so that is how we have these two uh, nerves as branches of the maxillary nerve they have other branches also in the infra orbital canal and in the face but we were just concerned in this question with these branches okay it's an important nerve and you should remember these uh, this entire thing by heart now next question is all of the following are branches of the cavernous part of internal carotid artery except now the student had a question as to what is cavernous part of internal carotid artery mean so for that we understand that the uh, you know this is a common carotid artery and over here is the uh, you know the sinus uh, bulb and then you bifurcate it bifurcates into external and internal carotid artery so the internal carotid artery goes all the way into the brain and it is a long artery okay so it has the cervical part petrous part the cavernous part where it is closed or uh, you know where it is in the cavernous sinus of the brain and then it is a cerebral part okay so in the cervical part there are no branches that it gives out in the petrous part it moves it gives certain branches seen in blue in the cavernous part it kind of turns you know one and two it turns and um, it gives out these branches in inferior hypophyseal artery meningeal branch superior hypophyseal artery and in the last cerebral part or also called supraclinoid part it gives out so many branches which are all mentioned in blue ophthalmic posterior communicating etc so all these branches except the ophthalmic artery which is the branch of the cerebral part of the internal carotid artery these three are branches of the cavernous part now next question preganglionic secretomotor fibers does not include cauda tympani lesser petrosal lingual and facial nerve now the answer is that all of these are carrying preganglionic secretomotor fibers okay all of these nerves so we see the facial nerve here this entire thing the facial nerve and the red one the red fibers are the preganglionic secretomotor fibers right then here you know the when uh, it gives out the cauda tympani branch and the cauda tympani branch uh, carries some secretomotor fibers also uh, it joins with this blue nerve which is the lingual nerve so both of them together are carrying uh, secretomotor fibers right so cauda tympani is carrying lingual nerve is carrying facial nerve is carrying so these are all carrying also the letter, lesser petrosal nerve it supplies the uh, parotid gland and it carries preganglionic secretomotor fibers derived from the tympanic plexus and uh, it carries preganglionic uh, uh, parasympathetic fibers or secretomotor fibers which relays in the otic ganglion so all these fibers are carrying uh, secretomotor fibers secretomotor fibers to submandibular salivary gland are carried in all of the following except so in the previous question we saw that you know the facial nerve is carrying the red fibers which are the secretomotor fibers okay these same red fibers they are you know continuing like you know they are being branching off as cauda tympani which also carries secretomotor fibers and it goes along with the lingual nerve so so the lingual nerve the cauda tympani nerve and the facial nerve all are having secretomotor fibers but not the mylohyoid nerve the mylohyoid nerve is a branch of inferior alveolar nerve it provides motor sensation to anterior digastric and the mylohyoid muscle it is also sensory innervation to the inferior aspect of the chin next which of the following artery passes between the roots of the auricular temporal nerve so this is a very simple question you know this um, again this is a fifth nerve and we have these this loop that you see you know like this uh, over here this small loop that is the auricular temporal nerve it is a branch of the mandibular branch uh, uh, of the trigeminal nerve 
okay and in between this loop you see one artery is going all the way up that is the middle meningeal artery it is a branch of the maxillary artery okay so the most appropriate answer is the middle meningeal artery simple question now one of the students has asked about the muscles of facial expression and uh, there's nothing much to explain in the muscles of facial expression we just need to know the various attachments and their positions and what uh, expressions are responsible when the particular muscle contracts all the muscles of facial expression with a few exceptions are supplied by uh, are um, a part of the second pharyngeal arch and uh, they are supplied by the facial nerves and uh, the contraction of these muscles produce various types of facial expression you see these are two bellies of uh, occipito frontalis then this is procerus this is orbicularis oris this entire muscle here if you see closely this orbicularis oris has two parts the orbital part and the one closer to the eyelid called palpebral part okay it is uh, going to cause uh, narrowing of the eyes the one that is closer to the eyes okay then we have uh, nasalis we have levator labii superioris over here which raises the upper lip and wrinkles the nose zygomaticus minor and major the two muscles they stu um, they pull the uh, upper lip uh, and the corner upwards and literally and are responsible for they are called the smiling muscles also along with the rhizorius then we have depressor anguli oris which lowers the corner of the mouth depressor labii inferioris then platysma muscle mentalis muscle which pushes the chin up and wrinkles causes wrinkles here in the chin then we have orbicularis oris which controls the shape of the mouth then buccinator muscle when we blow if we are involving the buccinator muscle or even when we are whistling then we have uh, levator anguli oris which lies beneath these muscles when we cut them we can see levator anguli oris right it will also pull uh, the corner of the mouth literally nasalis so masseter here is given it pushes onto the buccinator muscle but it is not a muscle of um, facial expression it is a muscle of mastication okay it's supplied by the mandibular nerve so we all need to just carefully look at the picture and read this table to know uh, what are the functions frontalis here causes horizontal wrinkling of the forehead and corrugator superciliae over here it causes vertical wrinkling of the forehead so just go through that that's it this is the end of this slide hi welcome you all to another session of anatomy doubt solving internal auditory meatus transmits now internal acoustic meatus or internal auditory canal is here it lies between the internal ear and the petrous temporal bone all right and it uh, this hole is showing you what all it carries it has the cochlear nerve the inferior vestibular nerve the superior vestibular nerve then on top is the facial nerve and in between the two is a small nerve called the uh, intermediate nerve which is also called nervus intermedius or nerve of wisberg so as you can see all these options are correct all the following statements regarding the pharynx is correct except let's examine them one by one the opening of auditory tube is located in the lateral wall of the nasopharynx this is the opening of the eustachian tube or also called the auditory tube okay and this is the nasopharynx all the way here till here this is the nasopharynx so the first statement is correct soft palate is at the level of separation of nasopharynx and oropharynx so this is the soft palate and this is blue is nasopharynx this is oropharynx so soft palate lies at the level of separation of naso and oropharynx second statement is also correct pharynx is continuous with the esophagus at the level of sixth cervical vertebrae so here 
this is nasopharynx this is oropharynx this is laryngopharynx this is the larynx right behind it is the laryngopharynx and this area is also the narrowest part of the uh, uh, of the pharynx and it is continuous with the uh, it is at the level of the sixth cervical vertebra okay so third statement is also correct then the last one is afferent limb of the gag reflex is 10th nerve and efferent is 9th nerve so since all three are right this one is the wrong statement let's examine though about the gag reflex a little in detail now uh, any gag uh, any reflex actually has a stimulus a sensory loop uh, place where the loops uh, where the sensory loop uh, synapses and meets the motor loop and then there is an effector or the action of the muscles right so now gag reflex tests the normal motor response of 9th and 10th cranial nerve it is a protective response whenever there is foreign body in the larynx and the pharynx it is a protective response of preventing such uh, particles from going inside the larynx right so whenever we stroke this area the uvula or the lateral aspect of the uh, oropharynx then uh, you know the there are several receptors present here these carry the sensory uh, information via the glossopharyngeal nerve see here we are stimulating the soft palate the sensory or the afferent loop is formed by the ninth nerve goes to the brain stem goes to the brain stem and then the vagus nerve carries the motor or the efferent loop and it causes the constriction of these muscles and that's how we have the gag reflex nasopharynx consists of all except this is another question with you know we have to be very careful as to we have to memorize what is there in the nasopharynx oropharynx laryngopharynx etc so nasopharynx is commonly asked this area we have seen in the previous slide is the nasopharynx it has an opening of the eustachian tube or also the auditory tube now right behind uh, the tube uh, opening is an area of elevation which is called torus tubaris and uh, behind the torus tubaris is an area of recess which is called the pharyngeal recess or the recess of fossa of rosenmuller all right or in this area somewhere is present the pharyngeal tonsil okay so and right down here is a fold the salpingo pharyngeal fold above the salpingo pharyngeal muscle all right so except for the option a pyriform recess we see that all these three are seen in the nasopharynx let's see about the pyriform recess now this is another section this is a sagittal section this is the posterior section of the uh, pharynx okay so nasopharynx the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx when we come to the laryngopharynx all the way here to here is the larynx starting with the epiglottis now on either side of this epiglottis you see this you know pear, pear shaped depression this depression is the pyriform recess it is important because it is also called the smuggler's fossa it is important because you know right in, uh, you know it uh, the internal laryngeal uh, nerve lies submucosally in this recess and if uh, we injure that then there is anesthesia of uh, you know all the sensation of the mucosa from the epiglottis to the level of the vocal fold okay so the pyriform recess is in the laryngopharynx not in the nasopharynx next a uh, student was confused between kilian's dehiscence and zenker's diverticulum now let's understand these are the constrictor muscles of the larynx okay you have the superior constrictor these are different views sagittal view and posterior view okay so this is the superior constrictor here then you have the middle constrictor here and you have the inferior constrictor here now the inferior constrictor has two types of fibers these uh, uh, oblique fibers and uh, transverse fibers okay this entire thing is the inferior constrictor if we look carefully closely this same thing here we have these fibers which are thyropharyngeus and these uh, transverse fibers which are cricopharyngeus both of them are part of the inferior constrictor but between these two muscles there's a small triangular area where there's no overlap of the muscle so it is an area of weakness 
in the pharyngeal wall of everywhere else you know you have overlap the superior constrictor is slightly overlapped by the middle constrictor middle constrictor is overlapped by the inferior constrictor but between the two uh, you know fibers of the uh, the oblique and the uh, transverse fibers of the inferior constrictor there is a small triangular area here which is not overlapped and is an area of muscular weakness okay and so it is like you know it, this is in this cross section here same area seen in in sagittal section so this is an area where often times there is pouching pharyngeal pouching and this is called the zenker's diverticulum okay now next question following foramina are found in the greater wing of sphenoid except now before we go to the options let's see this is the sphenoid bone it has a body a lesser wing a greater wing and the pterygoid plates okay now when we come to the greater wing let's see what all is there here there's a foramen rotundum foramen ovale foramen spinosum sometimes between these two ovale and spinosum there's another small uh, foramen which is called canaliculus innominatus which carries lesser petrosal nerve all right so uh, all these are present in the greater wing of sphenoid when we come to this lesser wing of sphenoid we see the optic canal okay so the optic canal is a part of the lesser wing of sphenoid not the greater wing of sphenoid so the option here is d next rectus abdominis free flap is supplied by now what is a free flap okay free flap also called tissue flap they are important in reconstructive surgery or plastic surgeries okay that involve the transfer of tissue from one area of the body to the other so here we need to reconstruct the breast okay after a mastectomy so we take a flap from the uh, abdominal area now this flap has not only the skin and part of little bit of a submucosa some but uh, and little bit of muscle okay which may or may not be present the muscle may or may not be taken but along with the skin and the submucosa you, mucosa we also take the blood vessels of this area okay it is attached to the blood vessel the blood vessel the main artery over here is the epigastric artery so along with this we uh, you know use it for the reconstruction in any area in this picture it is shown in the breast area now uh, because of the presence of these blood vessels the take uptake of the graft is much better and the healing is faster all right so that is why free flaps uh, this is what is a free flap and in this question epigastric artery is the artery that is attached to this abdo rectus abdominis free flap now last question the nasal septum is supplied by all of the following except this is a very old 1999 aipg question and it is not framed correctly so it causes lot of confusion the nasal septum is supplied by the nasopalatine nerve you see here the medial and posterior nasal branches which are derived from the pterygopalatine ganglion okay the anterior superior alveolar nerve the anterior ethmoidal nerve which is a branch of the nasociliary nerve okay so this is what it is this is the correct option right here the option given is nasopalatine which is correct posterior ethmoid nerve now posterior ethmoidal nerve actually is a branch of nasociliary nerve and it is uh, normally many times absent it does not supply the nasal septum even when it is present it supplies the ethmoid and sphenoid air sinuses okay pterygopalatine ganglion you see this picture here this star shaped thing this is the pterygopalatine ganglion it is closely related to the nasal septum but as such it does not like the branches of the pterygopalatine ganglion this one supply the uh, nasal septum not the pterygopalatine ganglion itself but the branches of pterygopalatine ganglion which includes mid middle medial posterior superior nasal branch okay so here out of all the options posterior ethmoidal nerve is not uh, present only many times and if present it uh, it does not supply the na uh, nasal septum okay so this is that's why the answer is b but the question itself is not framed correctly because the nasociliary nerve actually uh, 
um, is a branch of ophthalmic nerve and this nerve the anterior ethmoidal nerve large branch and the posterior ethmoidal nerve are branches of the nasociliary nerve okay so that is why uh, yeah that is why the question is not uh, very well framed if we are selecting nasociliary nerve then posterior ethmoidal nerve is also part of or branch of the nasociliary nerve okay but amongst the given options posterior ethmoidal nerve is um, is the most correct uh, option here okay so that brings us to the end of this session thank you